Hi everyone, I'm Moss, the person, not the plant, and today we're talking about hagstones. Specifically, what they are and how you can acquire one. So let's get into it. So firstly, what is a hagstone? Well, hagstones are really cool. They're one of my favourite examples of folk magical charms that have got a long history of use and continue to be used down to today. They're very, very simple. Basically, they're just a stone or pebble with a naturally occurring hole straight through the middle that you can look through. They've got a lot of different names in the lore. Today, they're most commonly referred to as hagstones, but they've also been known as witch stones, mare stones, lucky stones, amongst other names. There's no real evidence that any one stone is better than any other for this. It's just as long as it's a stone with a, a hole straight through the middle from one side to the other, it doesn't matter what stone it is, it can be a hagstone. Now there is some variety to this. What's really interesting is the example of Wales. So Wales doesn't have hagstones really the way a lot of other places do, being these stones with the naturally occurring holes. Rather, they have a tradition of adder stones, or as they're known in Welsh, glein nadroedd. And those usually are glass beads or even spindle whirls. Um, so still they're these objects with a hole right the way through, but they're just slightly different, being composed of different materials. And the lore around them is really cool and interesting as well. Recorded in Welsh folklore by Elias Owen, we hear about the belief that adder stones were formed when a writhing mass of snakes would get together on Midsummer's Eve is given as one date, but there's different dates depending on the law you look to. Uh, they'd all get together, they'd be all excited, and around the face of the chief snake, a bubble would start to form from its nose, and it would push its way through this bubble that would go all the way along the length of his body before dropping from the tail uh, and would solidify into this glass bead known as the adder stone. So there's different variations on the tradition, but generally you have a stone with a hole right through the middle or some other similar material with a hole through the middle that's known for its protective or healing virtues. But how would you get one of these folklorically? Well, we've already looked at the Welsh example where you just have to wait till all the snakes got together and created their little adder stone or glein nadroedd or glide nader, and then pick it up and hope the snakes had gone away. But with the stone hagstones, there's been this belief for quite some time that you had to go out and find on yourself, on a beach, in a field, wherever, that the best hagstones are the ones you find yourself. But folklorically, that's not entirely true. So when we look to the law that's recorded, we see that the most common way of acquiring a hagstone or getting a hagstone that was believed to truly work was to be gifted it. This arose from the belief that the most powerful hagstones would have a succession of owners. They'd be kept either in the family or by close friends and then handed on as this working protective charm. Also arising out of the belief that powerful hagstones would be kept, there was a belief that stealing a hagstone was a way to make sure that you got a really powerful one. But that's not a common belief and probably not one I'd recommend. Being gifted one is a really good way to get one. Finding one yourself, absolutely no harm with that either. But there are a variety of methods to gain a powerful hagstone. What's really interesting as well is that, especially if you find one yourself, there is a folk belief that's very common that a hagstone doesn't truly work until it's been activated. So how would you go about activating your hagstone? Well, that again is very simple. These are very simple folk charms, very effective. All you do is thread a piece of yarn, twine, cloth, or even copper wire through the hole and then tie it, secure it, and then hang it on your property, carry it on your person, hang it in your barn, whatever, and it was active. But this belief goes a lot further. It's really interesting. Once a hagstone is activated, it can never touch the ground again or it will lose its power. In addition, there's a belief in some areas that once a hagstone is activated in this way and is tied up, if you ever need to replace the yarn that you've used or the twine, whatever, that you need to thread the new piece through first and tie it off before you can cut the old piece off. Interestingly as well, we have examples in museums of charms where multiple hagstones are hung on the same piece which seems to increase the efficacy for some people. Of course, this isn't the only way to use a hagstone. Within the law as well, we have people just picking one up and carrying it on their person. And that is completely fine too, especially people in jobs like fishermen or sailors. 
they would keep a hagstone on their person for good fortune and protection. Um, and simply carrying it on them was thought to bestow those virtues. So these are really, really simple charms, really interesting, really cool, and ones I really recommend because they're so easy to use. If you are interested in the traditional uses and benefits of Hagstones, feel free to check out my Patreon. I've got a little bit on there about it, which I'll link in the description below. But other than that, I've been Moss. I hope you've enjoyed a little look at the lore of the Hagstones, and I'll see you next time.